Hello, everyone. I am Oksana Lubigidna, a first year PhD student here at KU Mohela Academy. It is my pleasure to invite you to our session of today, the third webinar of the series Pohled Zogni, a look from the outside. I'm organizing on behalf of the Postgraduate Society of KU Mohela Academy. The series is devoted to the Ukrainian topics in linguistics, geography, history, and political science reflected in publications of prominent researchers who work in UK and US academic environments. Our goal is to look at um, Ukrainian issues from the outside to enrich one's perspective with new approaches, methods, and say, a way of thinking. We have a brilliant speaker today, Professor Feller from Oxford University. And so it is with great pleasure that we welcome him today to talk on the topic, hybrid linguistic identities in the 19th century Lviv. And now it is my pleasure to turn the floor over to Professor Danilenko from Pace University, US, who is a good friend and colleague of Professor Fellerer to introduce our speaker. Professor Danilenko, please. Yes, uh, thank you. And um, definitely it's a great pleasure and uh, I'm very happy to see several words about Jan Fellerer because, Oksana, yes, you're right. I deem myself a good colleague and a friend of Jan since uh, four years, it seems to me more than 15, 16 years um, when we first get, got in touch somehow. I've been following uh, Jan's research and uh, his publications, definitely. And uh, I can assure you that I can find, for example, not so many, just a few of linguists who show consistency and interest on in their topical areas to the extent as uh, Professor Fellerer shows uh, now and for years, as I told you. Um, so if you browse, if you Google the name, definitely you'll find that he is based in, uh, in the United Kingdom, but uh, he is originally from Germany. He graduated from the University of Vienna and uh, he defended his thesis at uh, the University of Basel, if I'm not mistaken, because I, uh, I rushed to buy a book which was based on his dissertation in 2005, uh, which was about uh, multilingualism in Galicia in uh, the modern period, yes. Uh, right away, I was just impressed by the, uh, the canopy, by the, the picture of how it was presented, because we always uh, talk and speak about multilingualism and uh, in Galicia in particular, but you need not just simply data, you need just also some methods, you need just theoretical basis for how you can interpret this. It's a wonderful phenomenon and we speak about this, but we, as I told you, not so many scholars can give you a more or less objective perspective on what, by the way, today, our speaker will be also delivering. Um, I'm also very happy when I was searching and looking for some contacts and publications back when I moved to the US to find that Jan Fellerer was a professor of non-Russian Slavonic languages. I was just right away surprised <laughs> by the label of this position, but the position is very interesting because uh, so far as I know, um, Professor Fellerer has been teaching and teaches a Polish a Czech, right? And perhaps to some extent, if uh, an opportunity comes up, perhaps uh, some other languages, but definitely Russian, it's a language which we know and which we also use in our research. And um, the, the term language contact, it's clear for me because I've, for example, I know I've been trying just to, just to to understand what it is and from the point of view of grammar from the point of view for example of vocabulary and some other internal structures and facts from a particular languages i'm okay but from the perspective of professor jan feller language contact it's something more synthetic it's just not only grammar it's just not only how grammars interact or vocabulary interact for example in these particular situations that's a much more synthetic vision 
of multilingualism and particularly in urban milieu. For me, I, I, I'm not, I'm not a specialist definitely in this field. This is why I'm sometimes, I'm very, very just simply, well, perplexed sometimes by the, the range of interest, what you can learn from these, for example, angle, which you can project on this multilingualism in these urban centers. Uh, if I'm not mistaken right now, Professor Feller based, and he confirmed basically, yes, he's based right now at the International Center, right, of uh, Research Center of, mul of Cultural Studies, let's put it like this, where he also right now has a project on multilingualism in Woj, um, which is a fantastic, yes, uh, place. And I personally know that, yes, so much interest in linguistic facts, cultural facts connected with this urban center in Poland. So we can expect another, if not a book, I don't know, perhaps some chapters in the future based on this particular research, but I always anticipate new publications, which should come, should appear, and authored by uh, Jan Feller. So on this note, on this positive note, uh, I would like just simply to give this floor back to perhaps uh, Professor Feller, yes, uh, who will perhaps do his job right now. Thank you. Thank you. Szanowni słuchaczy, drogi organizatory, szanowny kolego Andriu Iwanowiczu. Na samym początku ja chciałbym podziękować organizatorom za zaproszenie. Dziękuję także mojemu poważnemu koledze Andrzejowi Iwanowiczu za laskawy wstęp. Bud laska, przyjmij moje wybaczenia, że moja lekcja odbyła się angielską mową. Na żal, mi nie potrzebna dosyć dużo czasu, żeby przygotować lekcję ukraińską mową. Tak, temu Щоб вас не мучити своєю особистою мішаною мовою, дозволю собі тепер перейти на англійську. And I must start with an apology that there's a typo on the first slide. So I'm off to a bad start. I hope it will get better. It should, of course, be the key of Mohila Academy. Hybrid Linguistic Identities in 19th Century Review. The 19th Century Review does, I'm sure, not need any introduction to the audience of the Postgraduate Society of the Kyiv Mohila Academy. The second half of the 19th century was a time of rising national tensions and segregation in the city. At the same time, there were also significant contacts across linguistic, national, and religious divides in late Habsburg Lviv. In my talk, the focus will be on these contacts and their linguistic outcomes. In particular, language mixing and hybrid linguistic practices and identities. To start, let me briefly remind you of the main coordinates of the linguistic situation in late 19th century Lviv. Polish was the dominant language at the expense of Ukrainian speakers whose proportion, however, grew faster in the suburban villages surrounding Lviv. Yiddish, in turn, was concentrated in those districts of Lviv where Jews settled after their small ghetto in the old town had become overcrowded. This was especially the then second so-called Krakow district outside the borders of the old city center. Jewish Livivians had started to move there before all legal restrictions on settlements on settlement were lifted as a result of the Austrian constitution of 1867. Until the end of the Austro-Hungarian monarchy, German also retained a small yet prestigious presence in the city, for example, in the form of some high placed provincial officials or members of the armed forces. Thus, what we have in 19th century Lviv is a form of hierarchical quadrilingualism. It included Polish, Ukrainian, Yiddish, and to some extent also German. Inevitably, 
This gave rise to linguistic practices which needed to accommodate this linguistic diversity. In general ling sociolinguistic terms, such multilingual practices typically range between two, between two poles. At one end, complete dominance of one language over all the others, including their downright suppression. At the other end, some form of distribution of the languages involved across different domains of public and private life and spaces of interaction. Whichever form the linguistic practices in a particular multilingual society take, they will involve bi and multilingual competence among some of its members. This clearly also applied to historical Lviv. Here, bi and multilingualism was the norm among the city's middle class and their professional circles. As mentioned, the languages involved were not on an equal footing. At the end of the 19th century, educated Yiddish and Ukrainian speakers would have, had, would have typically had full proficiency in Polish, acquired in high school and university, while Polish speakers would have been unlikely to know Ukrainian, let alone Yiddish. Many of them, in turn, would have typically had proficiency in German. We thus get the following safely attested patterns in late 19th century Lviv. Ukrainian, Polish, German, trilingual professionals who considered themselves Ukrainian. Polish, German, bilingual professionals who considered themselves Polish. And polyglot Jewish professionals. This, the biographies of some of these professionals, including linguistic aspects, have been studied and recounted, such as in articles published in the very nice series, the Lviv Misto Suspilstvo Kultura. For example, to name just a few, the biography of the well-known Ukrainian lawyer and politician Yevhen Olesnitsky, or the law graduate and Ukrainian social activist Stepan Fedak, or the Polish High Court Councillor Józef Reichert, or the Polish Jewish Schorr brothers, of whom the eldest, Moses, came to prominence due to his activities in the humanitarian Jewish society B'nai Brit. This small choice of individuals is random, and their biographies differ in many respects, yet they converge on one important feature. They were bi or trilingual, highly educated members of the middle class. Their knowledge of languages directly reflected the balance of power in the city and beyond, with German as the quasi-official language of the empire, then before World War I, Habsburg Empire, Polish as the official language of the province, Galicia and the city, Lviv, Ukrainian as an acknowledged yet underrepresented regional language, and Yiddish deprived of any official status. Bi and trilingualism along this hierarchy was difficult to reconcile with the ever-growing national aspirations of the city's three main constituencies, the Poles, the Ukrainians, and the Jews. Jaroslav Hrycak, one of Lviv's foremost historians, argues that the consequences for Lviv were twofold. First, there was increasing compartmentalization of city life along national lines. And second, this combined with an assimilatory pressure on Jews and Ukrainians to adopt Polish and on Poles to adopt German if they had higher ambitions. Hritzak argues that, quote, most of the modern civic institutions and places for public exchange, including Lviv's famous cafe houses, were staffed and attended according to the national identities of their members, while dialogue between different cultures meant an assimilation of a subordinate group by a dominant culture. At first glance, this view is confirmed by the vigorous emergence of separate associations and clubs in late 19th and early 20th century Lviv, such as, for example, the Ukrainian sporting club Sokil, and its Jewish equivalent, Hasmonea, as responses to the Polish sporting club, Soku. However, insistence on national and linguistic segregation as the main pattern of late Habsburg Lviv raises important questions too. It places 
overriding emphasis on the Polish, Ukrainian, Jewish antagonism. And it marginalizes processes in the city and its surrounding villages that did not follow the generally perceived trend of ethnic conflict and compartmentalization. The American historian, John Czaplitska, for example, surmises that there was also a, quote, degree of urban cultural integration and community that did exist among the nations. Czaplitska feels reminded of it in the southern historical district of Lviv, where fine villas were inhabited by Poles, Ukrainians, and Jews of similar class and similar taste. How urban cultural integration and community might have exactly worked and manifested itself at this upper end of the social spectrum would require, would require proper investigation. From a linguistic point of view, this would need to shed light on how members of the middle class, such as the above mentioned Olesnitsky, Fedak, Reichert and Schor, used their competence in two or more languages in practice and how they accommodated their polyglot self with a more monolithic national denomination, which they may have chosen for themselves or which people around them may have imposed upon them. However, rather than on the Lviv's fully bi or multilingual members of the professions, I shall now focus on those constituencies of the city and the surrounding villages who did not neatly distinguish between languages and who did not necessarily have a monolithic ethno-linguistic persona. These were people in the city and in the surrounding area who engaged in different forms of language mixing and switching. That is, that is, these were people who transcended the linguistic and ethnic boundaries. This, it must be stressed, was not normally a conscious choice. It was, it was due to external social circumstances. The circumstances that engendered such linguistic hybridity and crossovers varied widely. The one important reason was undoubtedly the notoriously high level of illiteracy or poor literacy in the Lviv and Galicia as a whole at the time. Linguistic usage that is not checked against the norm of some codified standard language will naturally allow for considerable variation. Another important reason is the fact that a multilingual environment will inevitably produce certain strategies to bridge linguistic divides. Fully fledged by or multilingualism, such as among Lviv's educated middle class, is only one of these strategies. Language mixing and switching is another important strat strategy that had wide currency in fin de siècle wood. And a third important reason for linguistic hybridity in late 19th century Lviv and the region at large was paradoxically conservatism. A conservatism that did not want to, to that did not want to subscribe to what was the great political and social novelty of the time, namely ethno-linguistic nationalism. In late Habsburg Lviv and Galicia at large, conservatism could take the form of clericalism, that is the belief that the church and religion, not modern politics, should guide public life and create a sense of belonging. Conservative attitudes could also be informed by the conviction that the right constitutional setup is the monarchy or the empire, such as the Habsburg Empire or the Romanov's Russian Empire, and not nation states. In short, there were various circumstances and reasons that engendered linguistic hybridity and crossovers in late Habsburg Lviv. As a result, there were a key feature of the cities and regions linguistic landscape. In fact, I would even argue that it was the cities and the regions dominant pattern until World War I. That this fades so easily from our contemporary view is due to one difficulty in particular. Research into historical language mixing and linguistic hybridity, such as that of late 19th and early 20th century Lviv, poses a simple but significant challenge. These linguistic practices usually take place in speech, not in the written medium. 
If they are in the written medium, these are texts that then often receive little attention later on in history because they are not considered part of the core corpus for, say, the history of the Polish language or the history of the German language or the history of the Ukrainian language. Thus, the key challenge that arises is to identify the right sources that may grant us access to forms of linguistic hybridity in a past society. In other words, an important question is what sources there are to gain glimpses of linguistic practices in the past that existed in speech only, or that were subsequently discredited if they were in the written medium. One such source that has proven to be helpful to that end is the satirical press of the time. Since around the 1860s, there developed an extraordinarily rich and varied range of humorous magazines from Lviv and by Lviv-based Lviv writers and editors. This burgeoning satirical press had a distinctly local focus. The writers often employed stereotypes to identify particular social groups and to cast judgment on their alleged behavior and views. A prime device to that end was linguistic characterization, in particular substandard forms of linguistic usage, notably dialect, code switching and code mixing. I would now like to draw on a few examples from the city's Ukrainian satirical magazines to illustrate what types of linguistic usage the writers picked up on. They did so in order to make fun of or to comment on, on the views and behavior of people in and around the Lviv who they knew used the respective type of hybrid linguistic usage. Before we look at these examples, I must, however, flag two important introductory clarifications. First, we are looking at linguistic stylizations. That is, we are not looking at transcripts of speech as it actually occurred. The main purpose of the linguistic stylizations was indexical. That is, they signposted non-standard linguistic practices typical of a particular social group. How accurate such stylizations were in matters of linguistic detail, that is in terms of the phonetics, the morphosyntax and the lexicon of the variety that they were meant to represent is a more difficult question. I cannot pursue this question here. Suffice to note, that we cannot simply dismiss them as linguistic fabrications. At least to some extent, there must have been genuine reflections of important structural linguistic characteristics of the variety they were meant to represent. Otherwise, that is, if there had been mere linguistic fabrications, the intended satirical effect would have been entirely lost on the contemporary reader. And the second clarification I need to flag before we come to some examples concerns the content of these texts. As mentioned before, satire is very much of its time and of its place. It can therefore be very difficult for a reader like myself more than a hundred years later to fully disambiguate the dense web of reference and allusions to historical events and people that many of the texts include. What is more, the texts may project stereotypes that are pretty unpalatable to us as contemporary readers. For example, they may be openly anti-Semitic or anti-Ukrainian or anti-Polish. Now, with these clarifications in mind, let us now see some examples of how the satirical press of late Habsburg Lviv provides evidence for hybrid linguistic practices in the city and in the region at large. The first and most important type of mixed lect or dialect in terms of its frequency was the city's so-called bawak. In Polish dialectology, Lviv's historical bawak 
is considered a so-called Eastern borderland dialect that developed under strong Southwestern Ukrainian influence. The term bawak itself is of course derived from the Ukrainian verb balakate. The dialect covered a range of different types of mixing Polish with Ukrainian. Roughly speaking, it represented actually a dialectal spectrum. Even though Polish based as such, it could veer more towards Ukrainian or more towards Polish, depending on the speaker. This variability is exactly what the satirical press of the time exploited to project different linguistic personae, different linguistic identities. Take, <clears throat> take for example, the Ukrainian satirical magazine of the time, Strachopud, so scarecrow, scarecrow in English. Uh, this magazine, Strachopud, was a relatively stable fixture of Lviv's satirical press since the 1870s. In ideological terms, it was close to Galicia's so-called Russo or Muscophiles. These were those among Galician Ukrainian activists and intellectuals who thought of themselves as part of the Russian nation and who counted on association with it as a potential means of political and cultural emancipation from Habsburg-backed Polish dominance of the prominence and its capital city Lviv. In its own voice, Strachoput often employed a regional form of Russian that incorporated numerous Southwestern Ukrainian linguistic features. The peculiar amal amalgam mixture did not exist in speech but it built upon a long history of mixed written forms of expression among Galicia's Ukrainians. I'll come back to it later. Apart from this, the magazine also employed other linguistic stylizations to pinpoint specific constituencies of the city's population. For instance, towards the end of its existence in the year 1912, it featured a column um, on, in, in various of its issues, it featured a column titled Kotsia. At that time, the editor of Strachoput was Hrihori Hanulyak, who was of Lemko extraction and who had softened somewhat the journal's political stance for a generally more lighthearted approach. The Kotsia columns, as most of the articles in the satirical press, were published anonymously to be on the safe side with a censor. Kotsia was the name of a fictitious female correspondent who sent in hostile letters to Strachoput to hurl abuse at the magazine's Russophile orientation from the point of view of a fervent, yet still generally Habsburg loyal Polish nationalist from Lviv. Such fictitious readers' letters were a popular genre in the satirical press of the time in general. Um, they provided a format to mount, now they provided a format to mount a cliched caricature of the writer as a representative of a particular social group with the aim of denouncing their alleged views and behavior. And linguistic characterization, characterization was central to that end. Um, now, at first sight, and we will see a little extract in a second, at first sight, the anonymously published Kotsia columns in the journal Strachoput were composed in a stylized form of the Lviv Bawak. Bawak. As mentioned, this is usually considered a variant of the so-called Southeastern borderland dialect of Polish that had developed under strong Southwestern Ukrainian influence due to longstanding language contact. It is noteworthy that a journal aimed at a Ukrainian rather than a Polish readership should have featured this variety at all. It shows how integrated the city's various ethnic and linguistic constituencies actually were. Vice versa, we find stylizations of Ukrainian varieties in the city's Polish satirical press, which shows that their readership was equally conversant with these varieties, at least in terms of passive linguistic competence, and as long as it was in the Latin alphabet. <clears throat> 
But let us return to the Kotsia columns and one example of 1912 in particular. In content, uh, the text was a condemnation of a decision of the Tsarist government in Russia of July 1912 to extract the Helm Gubernia or Home Gubernia from the Governorate General of Warsaw, that is from the Polish Kingdom, and to incorporate it into the Russian Empire proper. This at the time was a politically highly charged move that drew fierce criticism from Polish circles in particular, including from Galicia. And let me show you a little the beginning of uh, um, uh, oops. Let me Yeah, I hope you can see uh, the beginning of uh, one of these Kotsia. It's not the beginning, it's, it's in the middle, as it were, um, of these Kotsia columns. Incidentally, here from Strachoput, um, etymological spelling with the, with the, with the, with the back year um, from 1912, um, issue number 11. An, a, a sort of a fictitious letter with this caricature to uh, Kohana Mashercho. And then just briefly to read you a little bit. Wiesz na wiesz, co saborci uchwali moskiewskie dumy w sprawie chemszczyzny zespołkowały się od razu wszystkie, wszystkie nasze partie. Nie ma nic złego, co by na dobre nie, wysz, nie wyszło. Mi tłomach. I od razu przejęły się duchem jednej narodowej myśli. Osobliwie nasza złota młodzież obu obrządków, lat łacińskiego i mojżeszowego, i to taka męska i żeńska, pozbierała się po różnych lokalach naszych towarzystw i podebrawszy tam kuraszu, podążyła wszystka pod pomnik Mickiewicza. Ach, jak to miło było, było popatrzeć na tylu tysięczny tłum protestantów protestując, protestujących przeciw narodowej krzywdzie, zrządzone nam przez Moskala and so on and so forth. Um, I, I um, tried to read it out um, with a southeastern borderland Polish tinge to it. Um, and in fact, this stylization, which you see there on your screens, I hope, represents some of the key phonetic features of the Lvivian Bawak, such as, for example, the raising, or as it is often referred to, the reduction of vowels in, in, in unstressed syllables. For example, the locative singular form uchwali instead of uchwale, or the nominative singular form serce instead of serce. This very characteristic feature, phonetic feature, um, had developed under the influence of southwestern Ukrainian, um, which uh, which is a, rith a so-called rhythmically, which has so-called rhythmically timed stress, as opposed to um, uh, Polish uh, proper, if you like, which has syllabic stress. So in the borderland varieties, we find this, the Ukrainian rhythmically timed stress imposed upon um, uh, uh, upon Polish phonetics, which produces which produces vowel reduction and uh, raising. And similarly, we find represented here in this stylization, the lowering of the stressed phoneme E to E in stressed syllables. For example, in our passage, we have a bewo instead of bywo, wszystki instead of wszystki. And this was also most likely due to substrate influence from Southwestern Ukrainian, which shows the same feature. However, Apart from such typical Bawak features, this linguistic stylization of the Kotsia columns goes even further. It also includes some linguistic traits that go beyond the normal Ukrainian inspired dialectal characteristics of the Lviv Bawak. For example, we see in our passage a lexical Ukrainianism that is not attested otherwise in the Lvivian Bawak namely the verb for the for of the beat of the of the heart to beat strongly and this is obviously from ukrainian tyokhkate another example is the reduplication of the local preposition in 
I didn't read you through that bit, that's further down. And so it's the reduplication of the local preposition in U V Lvovi in Lviv, with a distinctly Ukrainian pre-consonantal prepositional form U for in. And I surmise that the writer of this piece employed these linguistic markers to indicate that our fictitious correspondent Kotsia had some Ukrainian linguistic background, even though she had otherwise fully adopted the local Pol Polish vernacular in a bid to emulate the city's dominant language and culture. In fact, the name itself, Kotsia, appears to be the polonized form of the Ukrainian hypocrisy kotya, so literally kitten. The southwestern Ukrainian hybridization of the Lviv Bawak was in fact gradual. That is, as mentioned before, um, the dialect represented a linguistic spectrum and could veer to more towards Polish or more towards Ukrainian depending on the speaker. In the case of our fictitious correspondent Kotsia, we witness a still clearly Polish-based variety of the city's Bawak, but one that also accommodates a wider range of southwestern Ukrainian feature, features than other manifestations of the dialect. <clears throat> I would now like to move on to a second entirely different example of linguistic hybridization. As mentioned, the satirical magazine Strachoput was in ideological terms close to Galicia's so-called Russo or Moscophiles. Their political influence among Galicia's Ukrainians was waning fast in the last decades of the 19th century. However, an older and more conservative faction, conservative faction from which the Russophiles had initially emerged remained an important political force. These were uh, the so-called Sviato Yurtsi, named after the St. George's Cathedral in Lviv, the then mother church of the, Ukra of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church. They were adherents of a conservative Greek Catholic clericalism. They continued to support the Habsburg Empire and sought a political compromise with the Polish dominated administration of Galicia. The idiom they had traditionally used in writing came to be labeled pejoratively as Yazychie, that is in English something like gibberish. This so-called Yazychie was an unstable amalgam that was originally based on church Slavonic and incorporated elements from the southwestern Ukrainian vernacular, from Polish and increasingly from Russian. Towards the end of the 19th century, Russian effectively replaced church Slavonic as the linguistic base of the Yazychie but still with wide admixtures from Church Slavonic, from the Southwestern Ukrainian vernacular, and from Polish. Our co colleague, Andriy Danilenko, um, who of course has very kindly joined us for today's seminar and provided a very kind introduction, rightly confirmed Jota Bruch's analysis that this was in fact a new Yazychia at this later stage. In an article of 2014, um, um, Andri Danilenko profiled it as a, quote, regional variety of Russian peppered with numerous native and non-native, for example, Polish, German, Hungarian in, in um, uh, Transcarpathia. So a regional variety of Russian peppered with numerous native and non-native, for example, Polish, German, Hungarian, vernacular elements, depending on the age, education, and ideological orientation of the speaker, as well as literary genre, end of quote. Uh, Andri Danilenko also rightly states that the Yazyche warrants, in fact, a reappraisal, as it cannot be simply dismissed as a linguistic cul de sac in the linguistic history of Ukraine. It was, raw, it was rather one important strategy to counter assimilationist pressures in 19th century Habsburg, Austrian and Polish dominated Galicia. Still, the hybrid formation of Yazychie was viewed with derision 
by Lviv's so-called young Ruthenians or Ukrainophiles. They promoted national and linguistic rights for Galician Ukrainians. And they used the new vernacular-based Ukrainian written language as in use at the time in Galicia and Bukovina. That is, that is what one may call with Shevelyov the Galician Bukovinian Koine. Satirical magazines with a young Ruthenian, Ukrainophile political orientation took frequent aim at the Sviato Yurtsi and their Yazitsche. And so did, by the way, Lviv's Polish satirical press too. In the Ukrainian journals, this often took the form of a column, again, a regular article, a column attributed to a fictitious, to a fictitious Greek Catholic cleric associated with the St. George's Cathedral. Um, this column appeared under the title Me or Me, We, for example, in the journal Nove Zerkalo, so still Z, not Z, Nove Zerkalo, of a young Ruthenian or Ukrainophile orientation, Nove Zerkalo, started to appear from 1882 with Kornilo Ustyanovich as its first editor, um, a very distinguished um, um, figure in Lviv journalism at the time, Ustyanovich himself, he, he, was a, he was actually an artist, a visual artist in the main, in the main, in the first instance, and Ustyanovich himself probably also designed the caricature that accompanied those muy or me columns. Um, let us now look at an example from the second issue of the journal in the year 1884. Um, uh, before I show you the next slide, um, uh, a bit about the text. In this text, our fictitious writer, pretentiously referring to himself as we, me, in the pluralis majestatis, takes aim at an unnamed priest from the church parish of Horodanka. The reason was that the priest had criticized some content published in Sion Ruski, a clerical journal of the time associated with the Greek Catholic clergy of the St. George's Cathedral, which the fictitious author, author of our column held dear. Now, here you've got um, an example of this Mui column from Nove Zerkalo, uh, this stylization, 1884. Um, it is absurd to try to read it out in a way because it didn't really exist in speech. I'm still, it's still clearly Russian based as mentioned um, and we will discuss this in a minute, but just to give you a little bit of a taste, I'm, I'm giving it a try as it were. Užasna skoršenje dekanat horodenski vystupil protivko našeho siona, a daže dierzmul svojemu at um, uh, um, at paručnikovi dati palicenje, što bi na sabranje v Lvovje zajavil negodavanje klira kandekalneva pa povodu propagande celibatu i innih mudrosti za dier so dierzimih v stolpcah etova dragacenneva izdatelstva naricajuši tiže za bavnimi nesentencijami. Juž to my previdžovali takovuju, takovuju dezorganizaciju. I hocijas, hocijas nam ni podobajet naših predložnih kritikovati, pomnja slovesa svjatova pisanja. Ni sudite, da ni sudimi budite. To jedinakovo ž ne možemo malčanjem pominuti takovuju, takovuju ni lijepost. And so on, so on, and so on, and so forth. Um, now, as I've, as I've been trying to sort of um, entirely artificially to represent in my, uh, and you may not, my attempt at reading this out somehow, uh, the language of this text is, is, is clearly Russian based. However, it also includes linguistic elements that can be read as native Southwestern Ukrainian dialectal forms, such as the stem of the verb pret vidjuvate. The first person plural forms možemo, udivljajemos. The genitive singular in u in celebatu, 
of course, not celibatu, but celebatu. That's a different question. The dative singular in ovi, in odporučnikovi, and the conjunction yush for as soon as or already, which, albeit a Polonism in origin, had firmly entered southwestern Ukrainian. So at that point, I would argue we can't consider this Polonism anymore. For example, um, Yefen, uh, um, for example, uh, uh, Shelechowski has it in his dictionary. In his um, um, now, this passage, which I've just read out, also includes bookish church or bookish church Slavonicism, Slavonicism, such as the preposition protivko, the nominative plural form Slovyesa, and the particle si rieč. Finally, we also find various Polonisms, such as zgorszenie for scandal, from Polish zgorszenie, polietzenie for recommendation, clearly Polish polietzenie, and at the very bottom, which I didn't read you through, skazówka for hint, which is plainly Polish, skazówka. We even have the Germanism, again at the very end, which I didn't uh, get uh, to I mean, when I read it out, we have the Germanism Feuerwerk for fireworks. Now, this type of hybridization, as I said, was never used in speech, as far as I'm aware. Andri may have, uh, may be able to correct me, but as far as I'm aware, this type of hybridization was never used in speech, but it had a long history among Galician Ukrainians in writing. It was immediately rec recognizable to the readers of the journal Nove Zerkalo as a form of new ya Yazychia, which remained an important element of the linguistic landscape of Lviv and the region and la at large until the early 20th century, when then it really um, was um, on its deathbed, as it were. Um, let me now turn to a third and final type of hybrid linguistic practice that is also in evidence on the pages of Lviv's satirical press of the time. Mm. It sheds light um, on what must have frequently happened on the ground when Ukrainian and Polish speakers had dealings with each other, which they inevitably had. Such encounters did not necessarily involve the adoption of the earlier discussed Bawak by Ukrainian speakers. Rather, it could also draw on passive competence of each other's varieties. That is, speakers of Polish and Ukrainian dialects addressed each other in their native tongue and relied on the other's passive competence in it. For example, in a third Ukrainian satirical journal of the time, titled Komar, we encounter a fictitious conversation between the Polish peasant Bartek and his Ukrainian peer, Ivan. Obviously, the names chosen for being stereotypical Polish and allegedly um, stereotypical names, Ukrainian um, Polish. Um, now, these are our two peasants, our two fictitious peasants um, from some village outside Lviv, possibly. Um, uh, uh, Bartek and Ivan expressed their joint disapproval of a proposed land reform that was discussed in the Galician Provincial Assembly. That is the Galician Seim or Soim at the turn from the 19th to the 20th century. Let me show you this on my last slide. Here we go. So it's from Komar, uh, issue number five from the year 1900. Komar was also a Ukrainophile, if you like, satirical magazine in its general political outlook. But some of these journals were not particularly political as such, they were more sort of. Um, daily affairs and obviously they wanted to sell, they needed to be entertaining. We've got a little caricature there of Ivan and Bartek. We immediately note, and, and here we've got this conversation. Um, it goes on, it's only the beginning of it. Uh, and that must be a misprint. A o se najbilše hodit tomu hupci ta jeho priklonikam. 
Das ist feine Ponten Hupka und so on und so forth. Um, um, the anonymous writer of this little conversation um, assigns our Bartek a distinctly Polish based dialect, even though the Mazurzenie in Zwowiec and the old long A as O in Pon would suggest a non borderland dialect. Ivan's Ukrainian in turn is represented in the Galician Bukovinian Koine with clear dialectal elements. Um, um, and we can talk about them. Um, and in phonetic orthography. Um, uh, here in the guise of the so called Zelechivka. Thus, this example illustrates a third type of hybrid linguistic practice, namely the conversation switches between Polish and Ukrainian dialect. As with the previous examples, this cannot have simply been a figment of the linguistic imagination of the author of this fictitious dialogue. It must have borne some grounding in linguistic reality of late Habsburg Lviv and the surrounding rural region. Otherwise, the intended political commentary of the piece would have been lost on the readership of the time, namely that class-based categories, here two fellow peasants um, agreeing that this class-based category, these class based class case batteries categories remained as important as religious and ethno-linguistic categories. Here, two peasant peers from the Galician, Galician countryside joined forces to express their dismay about the politicians' ignorance of the needs of Galicia's peasantry, namely the freedom to partition arable land as they see fit. They do so, you each using their native variety. This must have been mm, on, the, on the assumption that the other can understand it. Partly, of course, due to the linguistic proximity of um, Polish and Ukrainian, and partly due to long standing exposure to each other's varieties in the Polish Ukrainian context of late Habsburg Galicia. Let me pause here and um, uh, take stock and then um, finish. Now we have seen three examples of hybrid linguistic practices in late 19th century Lviv and the surrounding region. One involved the city's distinct urban dialect, the so-called Bawak. Albeit Polish-based as such, it had developed under strong southwestern Ukrainian influence. It effectively represented a dialectal continuum that could veer more or less towards Ukrainian admixture. The ideological shape, the, sorry, the ideolectal, the ideolectal shape that the Bawak took, depending on the speaker, projected a nuanced range of linguistic identities, such as, for example, that of a native Ukrainian who, due to external pressure, had fully adapted to Polish as the dominant language, but still betrayed their Ukrainian background in the way they used the Bawak. The second example illustrating hybrid linguistic practices was entirely different. This was the so-called new Yazychia, used in writing only. This was a local Russian-based, at that point, Russian-based amalgam that accommodated an unstable admixture of native Southwestern Ukrainian elements, church Slavonicisms, and loans from Polish as well as occasionally German and in Transcarpathia also Hungarian. It clearly carried an indexical function too. Users of the Yazychia projected a linguistic persona who set themselves apart from the young Ruthenians or the Ukrainophiles in favor of a clerical conservatism that politically sought to maintain the imperial status quo. And finally, we saw a third type of linguistic hybridization. Here, it is not the linguistic varieties themselves that are mixed. Rather, mixing occurs at the interactional level, that is, in conversation, when the interloc interlocutors use their respective Polish and Ukrainian dialects on the often correct assumption that, still, that this still guaranteed mutual 
mutual intelligibility. These three examples do not exhaust the entire range of hybrid linguistic practices that emerged in a complex multilingual world, such as that of historical Lviv and the region. For example, I had no time to talk about Yiddish influenced Polish or about speakers who did not really mix Polish and Ukrainian, but who switched between them in their speech. Nor, of course, must all this obscure the fact that non-hybrid linguistic usage was also part of Lviv's and Galicia's linguistic landscape at the time. For example, on the pages of the satirical magazine Nove Zerkalo, um, mentioned before, on the pages of Nove Zerkalo, um, we predominantly find pieces written in what I labeled with Shevelyov the Galician Bukovinian Koine in phonetic orthography. No one lesser than Ivan Franco himself, under the pseudonym of Miron, was a regular contributor in the earlier history of that journal. Lviv's his satirical press thus allows us to explore the linguistic landscape of late Habsburg Lviv and the region at large in all its complexity. Hybrid linguistic practices and identities were an important part of it, even if not everyone today likes to admit to this or likes the fact as such. From a linguistic point of view, the texts raise the important methodological question to what extent exactly they reflect the grammatical and lexical properties of the different varieties. But this is a question that I must um, relegate to another talk. Thank you for your attention. So may I remind you, you can use our chat window if you have questions or you can ask them directly by raising your hand. Can I raise a hand before okay. some people ask questions, if you don't mind, okay? Yeah. Yes. Um, first of all, um, mm -hmm. I, will, I will give you just extra information than my, my short question, that perhaps uh, most of this material, most of this, for example, ideas um, Professor Fellerer expressed and outlined in his latest monograph, which was published in the series which I edit. And I think that I will share a flyer of this book, which is uh, with perhaps uh, with the help of our uh, hosts. Yes, uh, because you have my, co <laughs> I have two copies and Oksana has my second copy because I keep all these copies to then to bring to, to Kiev because I have already four copies of different books, which I would like just to donate to the National Library. Absolutely. Um, my question is very, uh, perhaps naive, because recently I wrote in a review of a book which appeared in an English translation. Uh, the book originally is uh, by um, Świątek Adam uh, with the title Gente Ruteni Nazione Poloni, which is a wonderful book, uh, which gives you a perspective and um, a picture of what was going on over the 19th century in Galicia, even in terms of uh, linguistic um, relations between different uh, communities and uh, also between different <laughs> uh, parts of this Ukrainian community. My question is the following. To what extent, for example, mixing and uh, switching code switching can be connected with the different levels of our, uh, national identity. Because you mentioned definitely Asiato Yurtsi, you mentioned some other groups uh, uh, who were interacting uh, during the second, pi second part of the 19th century. Uh, and I know that most of them did not identify themselves uh, as Ukrainians, uh, right in the middle of the 19th century, they didn't know act actually what to be a separate, for example, national group or community. Most of them, most of them, definitely, at least in the mid of 19th century. So to what extent this uh, level of national identity correlates with the level of a mixing and uh, code switching? Because from uh, 
if taken at face value, yes, it is related, but perhaps you have some observations and generalizations in this respect. Yeah, thank you, Andre, for, um, for the book recommendation. Um, um, I saw it somewhere and um, I'm glad you reminded me of it. So I must, I must definitely must have a look at Shiontek's, um, at Shiontek's um, book. My talk, as Andri also um, uh, implied at the beginning, was very much based on research I did towards that book, which Andri kindly mentioned and which appeared in, in, in a wonderful series, which Andri um, um, edits. Um, I spent a few wonderful months in Lviv in the Stefanik Library, where most of these satirical magazines, the Ukrainian ones, are held. Extremely um, a, 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 um, a wonderful um, small reading room with great staff who um, bring you every any, everything um, you need. By the way, um, yeah. And uh, now to the uh, to your question, Andri. Um, it's a, it's of course an excellent question. It's an a crucial question, and one which I want to be very, very careful about. Um, um, careful about, so we've got hybrid mixed linguistic practices. I think that's demonstrably the case. And what conclusions we can draw from these linguistic practices about national identity is, is of course an incredibly interesting, but also an incredibly dangerous question as it were. Because by using this or that variety is not necessarily an indicator of who you felt you were as it were. It can be, but it needn't be as it were. Um, um, clearly, if you were, if you used Yazidchia, that was clearly an indication of the fact that you had a problem with the idea of, of a Ukrainophile national identification, and that you thought of yourself as a Greek Catholic, but in the Habsburg context. So that's relatively, uh, relatively clear. Now, if you've got a, um, someone who who clearly has a southwestern Ukrainian native background, but due to the simple pressure in the Lviv that you needed Polish, adopted the Bawak, this or the um, this this local dialect, and used it in a way that still imported a greater amount of southwestern Ukrainian elements. Um, now, what should we deduce from that as to the identity the speaker might have had? What it clearly suggests is that it was somebody who had no choice but to adopt this variety. But did they therefore feel more less Ukrainian that somebody who did not adopt this variety is 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 very difficult. To, in some end, it's very difficult to, to to say, or it's very dangerous to make this this to, to draw this conclusion, as it were. There are instances. For example, we have uh, we had uh, uh, we had a, we had a there are for example some famous court cases which then were also taken up in the satirical press um, against Ukrainophiles um, and they were accused of of, uh, of conspiracy or something by the Habsburg by the Habsburg um, authorities and they were put on trial and all that as it were and uh, they consciously. We know they consciously spoke Ukrainian during the trial, even though the whole court, um, even though even though the court otherwise used Polish, as it were, that was a conscious choice and clearly projects a national identity. So in some cases, we can we can be courageous and deduce or draw conclusions about the national identity. In other cases, I would be more. I would be more cautious, much more cautious, as it were, on the basis of the linguistic stuff which I'm looking at. I think, in general terms, what what does apply to late 19th, early 20th, not only Lviv but also other East Central European cities, you have a you have a parallelism. You have clearly certain constituencies who have become nationally aware and have a clearly 
nationally defined identity, but you also have constituencies that have not yet caught on to that idea. Um, you have, um, if you were a poor Bawak speaking laborer in Lviv, a bricklayer who needed to look for a job every day, irrespective of whether you were a speaker of, an, of, an, of a Southwestern Ukrainian dialect or whether you were in fact a native speaker of Southeastern borderland Polish, if you were of that social background, the sort of the national idea did not yet hold much promise as to what, what advantage would it have given you, as it were. So I also believe that there were still, as, as is generally known in nationality studies, that there were, of course, always parts of the society which, as you exactly said, Andri, which didn't know whether there were Poles or Ukrainians and didn't much care, as it were. They were Lvivians and they had to make a living and that they had a local identity. They had a religious identity. That was always very important, um, Jewish in any case, but also Greek Catholic or or, or Roman Catholic, but that did not necessarily mean that you felt you were a Pole or a Ukrainian. Mm. And that's exactly exactly also what the Genterutenos um, Nazione um, Polonos in a way also um, implies, um, even though with reference to a different class, namely mainly the nobility as it were. So, sorry, this is not a very straightforward answer to your question, but I want to be, even though it's such an interesting question, I want to be extremely careful about what conclusions we can draw about this, as about, about the linguistic practices we see and what kind of um, national or ethnic identity these people may have had or not have had. Thank you. I, I like your answer because you can project your answer on some other parallel phenomena in the other in the sec in this in the other side of Ukraine actually I, I think so I think I think it's the same I mean sort of the roughly speaking similar similar things one would as you say yes to, 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 to other to other places other cities in Ukraine and and elsewhere for that matter sure thank you mm -hmm. thank you we received um, the question from Nazar Bilecki. so he's um, he's asking um, can we compare the phonetic and syntactic material of the contemporary ethnologists who were researching Galicia's rural region in order to find possible ways of accentuation and code mixing in the city? Um, uh, yes, we can. And I think we do this to quite, an, to quite a considerable extent, as it were. So um, we, 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 we if I understand the question correctly, um, um, for example, now we, we look at we look at this odd linguistic stylization of Kotsia or all sorts of other stylizations, as it were, and to corroborate, to understand to what extent this is genuine linguistic material um, to describe this or that mixed dialect. The first thing you look towards is contemporary well-attested dialectal evidence and data as it were and you try to understand whether whether any of what you find in in, in contemporary southwestern ukrainian dialects is something which um which something which is something which may explain what you find in the historical data and the same applies to um to, to south eastern borderland polish dialects so yes you would you would definitely exploit a lot of the existing dialectological literature in order to understand what is what is well researched based on proper data going out into the field to the villages recording describing all that as it were um, and you take that that body of knowledge and you apply it to these historical texts in order to understand to what extent is this st stylization artificial and to what extent is it is it real linguistic evidence? Thank you. But probably another question that was from me. Um, um, it is related to this one. Um, do we have any ethnological material, uh, materials from from nineteenth century the, uh, and early twentieth century that can um, that attest um, code mixing, for example. There may be, and I'm not aware of it. Mm -hmm. um, the, the sort of what what is what is interesting material 
um, and which I, com which I comment is when people started making sound recordings, mm -hmm. when the technology was started to be exploited, that was a little bit later, not in the late 19th century, but that started in and around the First World War. Um, when um, 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 scholars went out there and 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 made recordings, and I tried to listen to, um, they are held, for example, in um, the sound arch in sound archives, and the three biggest sound archives that go back as far as that, as it were, um, are in 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 Vienna, in Berlin, and in Saint Petersburg, as it were. And if you're lucky, you hit. A record that recorded a speaker from Galicia, from Lviv, from some area that's of interest to you, as it were. And I didn't talk about this in my talk today at all. There are, um, um, for example, um, a couple of by now well-known recordings, very early recordings of a, Ukra of a, of a, of a, of a Ukrainian, a Lvivian, who speaks in southwestern Ukrainian um, with a lot of Polonisms, also a mixed dialect from Lviv, as it were. Rudnitsky, in a monograph from, from 1943, transcribed these little dialogues, as it were, and you can go to Berlin and even listen still to a few of them. Um, uh, a resource which I try to tap into, as it were, for the very early materials of that kind of, of mixed evidence from, 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 from southwestern Ukraine, as it were, or historically Galicia, uh, was the sound archive of, of Petersburg. Unfortunately, it's, um, it's not, they've got vast resources and they are very underused and they've got wonderful resources, but they are, many of them are not cataloged properly. Many of them are on wax discs. So all you hear is <laughs> that's what you hear you know this is a record of so this is a record this is a recording from say um, uh, 1916 of a speaker from uh, ivano frankivsk and you'd love to be able to hear that as it were right. but um, so um, and uh, um, um, in short these sound recordings are, are, in my view, a treasure trove, which have not yet been fully exploited. Um, that's one source which I'm aware of. But for example, the, in, the satirical press continued into the interwar period and, and Lemko stylizations, Hutzul stylizations, you find, them, you find them galore to make fun of these sort of, the Ukrainian magazines use these stylization of Hutzuls, of boykos and whatever, in order to sort of to present them either as, 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 as stately good peasants or to ridicule them or whatever it is they wanted to do as it were. But again, these are stylizations then. And in terms of auto, authentic material, the earliest I'm aware of are these early sound recordings as well as early, early dialectological studies which are also more or less from that kind of period. So the early 20th century, both for, for Southeastern borderland Polish, such as um, people like um, Elias, uh, like um, um, Nietzsche, and also um, for Southwestern Ukrainian dialects. But these are descriptions, and, but they may have little um, 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 excerpts, transcripts of, of what, what, what they heard when they went out into the field. Um, Ethnographic materials, maybe, um, and that's my ignorance, and um, that would be something um, to explore further. Thank you. Thank you. A note oh. from, yes, uh, Martin Rode. Uh, can you see this? That we have some Galician recordings in hand, yes, uh, by Osip. Zorsky and Filaret Kolesa, dating back to 1907-1914, uh, actually. So they exist. And they are, um, and, and, Andrea, I'm not, I'm not, I must, I'm not, I'm not sure whether I'm aware of those in particular. Um, yeah, I, I, I also, that's, uh, uh, Martin Rode knows better. <laughs> oh, I see, sorry, I, I yes. can't see the chat, I'm afraid, yes, yes, for some can, reason. That's, yes. mm, well, thank you yeah, very he much. Can he, he raise his hand, perhaps he can just tell us what it is. Yes, a, would, would, I would be very interested, obviously. Please, Martin. Okay, so uh, just a very few words, I will try to make it quick, because I'm much of a historian of science and ethnology, so I can keep talking and talking about the things which are kind of off topic to this wonderful talk. 
Um, so first of all, Shevchenko Scientific Society in early 20th century, they had huge, huge projects to collect folklore. Um, so that began already in the late uh, 1890s. And um, if you go into even Kiev archives at, what is this Academy Institute called? Uh, EMFA, uh, the Folklore Institute, mm -hmm. um, which is, um, I think in Hrushevsky Street in, in Kiev. Yeah. Um, so they have a vast materials uh, written down, not only by professional scholars, but also um, by local amateurs. Um, and um, well, the published materials, they may have run through some kind of filter already, I assume. But if you check out um, what the locals have written down, like local priests or local intellectuals, you, can, you, you cannot even trace, um, they might have been more unfiltered, but that's something uh, somebody more uh, qualified for dialectology should uh, check out. Um, and so then there is um, a Lviv scholar, well, a contemporary researcher now. Uh, she wrote, for example, on these materials collected by Osip Rozdolski and Filaret Kolesa, um, at least in the private uh, Kolesa family archive, there are, uh, it is possible to, to see these uh, Filaret Kolesa recordings. That's what I know by heart, but if you drop me an email, I can send you everything I have on that. Um, and the last thing on the Vienna collection from uh, World War I, um, they have digitized all these things yeah. and they edited it on three CDs. Uh, some time ago, I send, or I asked them to send a copy to, I believe it was Ukraina Moderna for review. I don't know if the review has uh, come up yet, but maybe they still have those for review. And if you'd like to do that, um, maybe they still have them. Uh, you can think about, by the way, such a journal which is entitled Ukraine's Come Over, based in Kiev. Speaking about reviews, possibly as yes, uh, well, surveys of this material. Keep it in mind. Okay. Well, th thank you very much for these um, suggestions. I'm, um, uh, that's brilliant. I, I know of the I know of the one from the Vienna Sound um, archive. Um, but it will definitely be worth looking the Shevchenko Scientific Society um, folklore. Um, um, they should have materials this and, and, and especially the Filaret Colesa, which, which I wasn't aware of at all, which um, is pretty um, which is pretty promising. The one thing, obviously, if you do something linguistic, as it were, is and is is uh, then they need to be from where you want them to be from. So if they're all of a sudden from Volhynia or if they're from Polisia or if they're from the wrong region, then it's of course incredibly interesting and rich as well. But if you are looking at the Lviv and the area, then um, and and you're claiming you're describing and you're analyzing mixed the, the dialects of that region, then you'd need speakers from there. But obviously there may well be materials from of, um, recordings of speakers from there in in those great resources which you mentioned. So thank you. Thank you. That's, that's a great discussion here. And I think if, if I may, um, I will ask one question um, about sources. So what are um, other Ukrainian and Polish linguistic sources that served as a basis for your research? Yes, it, it really is. It is really that, as it were. So one source is sound recordings. And for linguistic purposes, I allow myself to use anything up to the Second World War. Because um, um, while, of course, the political and historical circumstances were completely different, it is unlikely that the Bawak of Lviv over two generations morphed into something unrecognizable. So from the interwar period, for example, there are recordings from radio recordings in the dialect, which became popular. Um, um, there are further recordings in the sound archives uh, when people started liking this technique and went out there and, um, and, and made recordings, as it were. Um, um, the other one is, in fact, 
satirical stuff which goes on until the second world war and where you can in my view judge to what extent this is it, they are stylizations but in my view you can you if you use them judiciously you can judge you can extract what 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 kind of linguistic reality they represent and you have an ever growing amount of proper dialectal dialectological investigation um from from um perhaps even earlier than i thought um, um going by what um, uh, Martin R Rode said about the Shevchenko Scientific Society. So um, you've got ever more, uh, and th these are very traditional. So people just went to one village and they described what they found there and published it as it were. And, and this is the stuff which I would of course also use in order to understand the linguistic varieties that were around. And you compare these studies um, and, um, um, and try to identify um, um, to what extent that's Polish based, to what extent it's Southwestern Ukrainian influence, or whether it's actually Southwestern Ukrainian with Polish influence. And what you realize is that, the, that it's really a spectrum, as it were, that ranges from one to another. But the sources are, as I say, early sound recordings, the satirical press, other ways of representing non standard language, um, uh, um, and dialectological literature that. It, becomes available but there may be more i may well be ignorant of certain things that that one can use as well as it were as as as, as martin Rode, um, for example the colessa recordings this is why um coming together like this is 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 wonderful for the speaker because you get all these ideas back it is indeed um thank you Um, we are waiting for, for questions from other people, I think. Well, we... Yeah, okay. Um, so I will, I will thank you everyone for participating in this great discussion. That was wonderful. Thank you, Professor Fellerer. Um, I'm grateful to um, Postgraduate Society of Kilmohela Academy for for this um, for, the, for 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 this opportunity and to Professor Danilenko for the great introductory word. And um, I hope we will see each other soon. So we have. A wonderful event coming up in our series on May 27th. This is a talk by a professor by Professor Digan Krause, Birth and Death of Political Parties in Europe. Why so? Um, professor Krause is from Wayne, US. So this talk focuses on the cause on the cause of emerging and declining of political parties at a rapid pace, and we'll announce it a week before an event. Um, so please make sure you can join us. Thank you, thank you, everyone, and goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank